Hello. Woden's Day World News. Put out of favour, Woden. Wonder if he'll ever come back into favour. Must be hard for a god to fall out of favour. Anyway, first thing is Iata, the flying people, will this year, 2011, be a repeat of 2008. And we look to see that their asset utilisation, those their hairy planes presumably, load factor in red and single aisle utilisation in blue. I'm not sure what they are. But they're turning down at the end anyway, aren't they? Obviously the flying people are struggling. Next we find travel costs forced higher 2008 again. And obviously at the bottom there, jet kerosene prices, jet fuel, going up and must be crushing them quite hard. And fare and fuel surcharges going up, can't be helping, must stop people flying. And this next chart is easy, uh, is interesting. Um, oil price surge fueled by monetary expansion. They've decided why the jet kerosene prices are going up. Brent crude oil prices are going up. Obviously, that's what it's based on. But they think they've gone back one further answer and decided that it's the US monetary base that's gone up. It's a strange thing to have in the IATA um, paper there. So they blame it on the Fed. Why not? So many people do. Anyway, let's move on. What we've got here, deal book. Oh yes, in Vietnam, a straight company plays loose with lenders. What we've got here is a ship, Vietnamese shipbuilding company that diverged off into other things and got itself into a bit of trouble. And the bondholders are saying, pay up, uh, come on government, pay up. And the government's going, no, you invested in the company, not in the country. That's commies for you. You can't trust them. Uh, this is from Pink Picks, Financial Times. An interesting enough article, but this is just the headline for it. Time to stop propping up Egypt's currency. You can imagine the, tr the turmoil that they had in Egypt at the start of the year and how it is now with different people in power and things happening. Uh, since January's ousting of Hosni Mubarak as president, Egypt's economy has come under enormous strain. Tourism has plummeted. Understandable. Would you want to go there? Foreign capital has fled on one of those IATA flights. And domestic investment has all but stalled. Again, you know, even if you were in the country and very patriotic, would you invest big in a future business before things settle down? After who all, who is in charge in Egypt? I don't know. It's meant to be the army, isn't it? I don't know. They're going to have elections, I'm sure. Uh, the International Monetary Fund has bunged them $3 billion. Um, but there's a great big question mark hanging over the currency in Egypt. Next, Bells in Hell That Don't Go Ting-a-Ling-a-Ling -a -ling by Edward Hugh. After the bricks came the pigs. You know, um, Brazil, Russia, India and China, the bricks, the pigs, the Portugal, Italy, Greece and Spain. Now a new acronym is being born, that of BELLS, which is Bulgaria, Estonia, Latvia and Lithuania. Um, however, are not set to hollow cast metal instruments hung from the vertex and rung by the strokes of a clapper dong dong they are countries countries which may like those unfortunate world war one british soldiers whose love of their country and sense of duty lured them into the one of the most senseless conflicts of modern european history be headed towards this is the are those countries uh, bulgaria estonia lithuania and latvia headed towards their own pretty unique form of modern purgatory they've the eastern countries of europe have really tied themselves up in knots to get in with the euro and the eurozone and this is a very long article. If you're the slightest bit interested in Latvia, as Edward Hugh is, it gives you the complete rundown on how tied up they are now 
and they're being held as the paragons of fantasticness by the Central Europeans of just what you can do if you try. But Edward Hugh is casting a dim view look on it and saying, they've tied themselves up and they're not going to get out of it. Um, and it's, it would be such a, a shame. They're doing all this to get away from their past communism of the East and trying to move West, but are really crucifying themselves to do it. And in the end, um, crucifying yourself doesn't always make you feel better. Anyway, move on to the global fallout of a European collapse. This is by Kenneth Rogoff, Rogoff writing in the Financial Times. As many commentators have rightly observed, the Euro experiment is at a crossroads. Either the Eurozone will deepen into fiscal union, or the weak members will be forced to break off. But the Euro experiment has also brought us to a crossroads in the whole international monetary system. Will our grandchildren inherit a world with a huge number of national currencies or a very small number of multi-country currencies? You can imagine, in, in, for the future, which is better, which is worse, which ones do the real power brokers want? So from the middle of this article we get, unfortunately, as currently construed, the euro is looking very much like a system that amplifies shocks rather than absorbs them. The UK, which of course did not adopt the euro, has benefited from a sharp, sustained depreciation of the pound. The peripheral countries of Europe are meanwhile stuck with a woefully weak competitive position and no easy adjustment mechanism. Normally they'd get their currencies devalued in Greece and Spain and etc. But they do not have that option. So they have to devalue their own labour by taking labour um, wage cuts. European leaders plan to achieve effective devaluation through major wage adjustment. And that seems far-fetched. The only clean, clean rescue for Europe would be if growth far outstripped expectations far outstripping mine i'm sure unfortunately post financial crisis growth is likely to continue to be hampered by huge debt burdens all part of his book with carmen reinhardt this time it's different and you get up to so much um, sovereign debt and for some reason or other the economy slows down he finishes with, having a smaller number of currencies is a phenomenon that makes a lot of sense economically, that's for the world, to have currencies like the euro. Econom economizing on transition costs and leveraging economies of scale. The real question is whether common currency is sustainable politically. My guess is that if the current slow patch in global growth does not quickly subside, in other words, we need growth soon, or we will not have long to wait for the answer as to whether the euro as a single currency is a good plan or not. Move on. Germany rethinks cuts to solar subsidies. And we read in the bulk of this article, Germany's nuclear generation capacity is just over 20,000 megawatts. And we know that in the next decade, they're phasing that out phasing out 20,000 megawatts of nuclear power. The German government had anticipated growing the country's solar generation capacity by 32,000 megawatts by 2020. But the loss of nuclear generation is expected to increase that number considerably, but significantly. So they're cutting out 20 and they're going to put, try and put in 32 plus 40,000 maybe megawatts of solar power by 2020. Good luck. Over in the United States of America, U.S. energy expenditure is a percentage of GDP. Grigor, U.S., has given us this chart, and he's put a lot of work into working it out, so we should give it a, a reasonable look. The, the biggest red pillar there is 2008, the price spike, where 9.83% was the US energy expenditure as a percentage of GDP. That was at its height. And take it back to 2002, it was down at 6.22. 
but you can see from 2002, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, it went up every single year as a percentage of GDP. It's dropped down, it's come up in 2010, and I presume it's coming up again in 2011. But that's quite a, a large percentage of expenditure as a percentage of GDP. Finish with these two charts from Credit Suisse. Population growth rate. Now we're talking countries, Germany, Japan and the United States. Germany in red, Japan in grey, the United States in true blue. Uh, 1980 it starts, and 2020 it finishes. So we've got projections in the future, but projections probably be pretty accurate in this case for population growth we can see roughly where we are now uh, 2010 population growth has gone negative for Germany and Japan but it's still well po positive for the United States it goes more negative in 2010 2015 for Japan and Germany even more negative in 2015 2020 for Japan and Germany with Japan really going away dropping in their um, population growth but the United States demographically not in bad shape last one same source labor force growth rate you know how p the, the the young people come into the labor force and then retire out so they're coming in in cohorts so it's a bit up and down uh, where we are at the moment 2010 we can already see that Japan is going terribly negative amount of people less people going into the labor force uh, Germany not bad um, the United States really quite good but where um, the trouble starts is Germany Japan continues to be in trouble but Germany in 2010 the labor force increase is negligible just about nothing and 2015 it's not long away it's in the time scale of decommissioning nuclear power plants and commissioning solar and wind plants in Japan it, it continues to get worse but it gets a very very bad five-year period 2015 to 2020 for Germany for labor force a lot of people retiring in that five-year period so those, that sun better shine on Germany or they're going to have to work harder, especially seeing they've got the rest of Europe to support as well. Bye.